I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and again, I appreciate you joining with us. And as you may recall from last week, we were enjoying a visit with Grant Palmer, and I appreciate you spending time with us. As I mentioned to you, uh, Grant has written two books, The Incomparable Jesus and Insider's View of Mormon Origins, sold over 20,000 or so copies, and uh, an excellent read. Um, I might mention here, that when I got to, came to my kind of faith crisis, I started looking for something to help support my testimony of the church. And I looked on the back of this and it said, Grant Palmer is a three-time director of LDS Institutes of Religion in California and Utah. And I thought, well, who better to help teach me and guide me a little bit than this book? Because I, I didn't feel like I was looking at anything anti but it sure taught me a lot. So I appreciate that, Grant, uh, how you've influenced me, and I'm sure you've influenced many, many others. We were just finishing up or talking about the Salamander Letter and your involvement with that with Steve Christensen and, and Mark Hoffman. And well, you wanna, do you remember where you were at exactly with that? And what I guess I was mo most interested in is how that made you start searching a little bit more. Uh, you'd put a few things on the shelf over the years. I guess we didn't elaborate which ones. Could you tell us real quickly which things you'd put on a shelf and t up through 1984? Well, in the, in the course of, of, of my studies, which I've always researched and studied and shared, uh, I, I found I probably knew a, a good many of the problems that did we you, different versions of the first vision yes all that. of that all of that kind did, of did thing. you know about joseph's polygamy and polyandry not so much the polyandry yeah. for some reason yeah and the young, and, if, and if i did it didn't, didn't click read, with me yeah, i thought wow me, me either <laughs> but you knew about the changes in the book of mormon oh all that kind of stuff yes yeah. Yes. Were you aware of the Tanners at this point? Oh, yes. I, I met Gerald in oh, 1968. You? I remember going down there when I was in California and stopping by the bookstore just to pick up something. And Because that's the only place you get the old documents. It's like Reed uh, Durham used to say. He's the institute director at the U of U. He says, the only place I can get my original uh, Times and Season, the Ensign magazine, is, is from the Tanners. Because they were doing that microfilming service, <laughs> Exactly, right? and, that, and that's what I was buying, so I could find out more about the early period. Yeah. Because I was a colonial historian. I mean, I... So that, that was your that's interest. That's my PhD was focuses yeah. on that. Uh, but anyway, uh, Steve Christensen hired one of the senior historians in the Smith Institute to do background because he paid, I think, $30,000 for that letter, and he was going to yeah. release it. Yeah. And, uh, and in the process, this historian, uh, he found a copy in the, uh, the Golden Pot yeah. by E.T.A. Hoffman in Glen, I think Glendale, Arizona, is the only place I had a mm. copy of this. And so he read it. It was like a 70-page short story or no novella. And... Uh, and then he asked me, he says, I'd like you to read this, see what you think. And then we'll get, we'll get together and talk about it. And Well, I read the thing seven times. <laughs> and when we got together, he says, well, did you see the part about uh, Joseph, uh, or, or I mean, Anselmus? That's this, Joseph's this, 
in counterpart right. in this 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 fictional story, yeah. uh, where you got the, the 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 record, the ancient Atlantean record on the equinox. <laughs> Did you see how he had gone there f uh, several years and he had the dream three no times way. in one night? I says, yes. I says, but did you see this, 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 and this? And by the way, it's chronological <laughs> to the story in the, in, yeah. the, in the early church. In the early church. Yeah. And that's what caught my attention. So, wow, I just took a deep dive into that and, uh, wow. and wrote up something, uh, oh, 40, 50 pages. So, uh, <clears throat> was encouraged by a couple of pro history professors at BYU to publish it. And, uh, and then I decided not to. Oh. <laughs> and you've actually covered that golden pot in your in your book, Insider. Yes, and, and I wrote so. that not so much to prove this is where Joseph got it, but to make a point. Yeah. Joseph was such a sponge in a mirror, you know, he absorbed and then he reflected and he was very good at that. Yeah. And we know where he got a lot of his other ideas, but what about the angel gold plate story? No one has ever really said where this story came from. And so I, I wrote in, if you read, I think it's chapter 5 in, in the Insider's View, my book, that he probably got it from some of the folklore in the environment. Uh, he may have got some of the story. The story was in the environment. Yeah. And I won't go into that, but there was a, there was a guy named Lumen Walters who had studied over in, in the Sorbonne in uh, Paris. And uh, there's a connection there back to Hoffman and Mesmer. Hmm. Hoffman knew Mesmer, and Mesmer, uh, hypnotism. Oh. The father of hypnotism. Uh, wow. He he was a stu student there, and then he came home, and hmm. Joseph and his father and some of the neighbors hired Lumen Wallers to teach him stuff. Hmm. And we can't prove that this is the book he was using, but it, it's certainly may have similar, had an influence and similar kind of story. Well, and then we know about the view of the Hebrews and the King James Bible. That so is many all things involved. Yes. What did you think of the church leaders being influenced by? Did that bother you at all that they were willing to spend money either to bury the information or to get it so, so that it would come out? Did, did that kind of bother you at all or think about it? Well, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Uh, I mean, that they were duped as well by this person, and you, you kind of figure they would have more discernment than that. I mean, the spirit of discernment or something. Oh, you mean you're talking about Hoffman's documents? I'm ta yeah, I'm, I guess I'm talking about documents. Well, Hoffman's. yeah. I mean, yeah. we used to teach those stories, you know. I mean, John Taylor picked a woman out of the Logan Temple, and she had this overwhelming impression that she didn't have a recommend, and sure enough, she didn't. We used to teach that story, and a few others. Yeah, they and, were inspired. And of, then, then you see in the church news, uh, uh, President Kimball and Tanner looking with a magnifying glass at the these bogus documents. documents. Uh, yeah. I mean, come on. Uh, kind of makes you, kind of makes you wonder, doesn't it? <laughs> Well, let's see. You've got so there's so much, and, and maybe we could spend just a minute on the books. How uh, you wrote this book originally under a couple of different titles, right? Yeah, it started out as. Uh, what did it start out as? Well, I've got them actually written down here, so <laughs> somewhere, New York Mormonism. New York Mormonism and understanding Mormon origins. No, and then there was a, another was installment in there about towards understanding Mormon origins. Oh, okay. And then um, Smith, what's his first name? He's George? A, George Smith, founder yeah. of Signature Book. He called me up one day. He says, you, some of your papers are circulating. We just, I'm intrigued by it. He says, uh, if, you, if you want to publish it or you, you want to turn it in for publication, we'd like to take a look at it. And up to then, I had never even considered doing writing a book. Writing huh? a book, but but you put out these other papers. And yeah, I just sending them out and see yeah. what would happen. And, yeah. And uh, I actually did it under a pseudonym, uh, Paul Pry Jr. Oh, really? Yeah. And uh, that, that lasted last about three long. months. Yeah, that's what and I, I heard. Because everybody it was, knew it was kind of dangerous to be publishing. Well, yeah, Sending being a CES, papers, seeing yeah. a CES employee. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I was in good faith. I, I was just trying to find a, 
uh, some interesting information is merged. And you there. really weren't challenging your testimony or no, trying to no. influence anyone else. You're just sharing what you yeah. What, you what do you think of this? You got any comments? Uh, yeah. Any things? And then, like I say, uh, the two professors at BYU says, "Well, I think you ought to publish this in BYU Studies or something." And that's about the time George Smith says, "Where well, he'd like the manuscript." And then I think, "Well, maybe I'll just write a book. I won't write an article." Mm. And that's what that's what happened. Up and, and George Smith, I think, he didn't think the cat title was catchy enough. So he's the one that came up with the yeah, he, he more. did, and and he was right. This is a more catchy title. <laughs> well, I think we may have jumped ahead a little bit because the book came out in two thousand two, mm. and in nineteen eighty four was when again the salamander thing kind of got you thinking again. But you were having a little struggle then, teaching basic Mormonism to the high school students. Is that true? Yeah, as, as time went on, 84, yeah. 5, 6, 7. And that's when you finally decided, or you had an opportunity to go to the Salt, Salt Lake County, County Jail. Jail. And I, I jumped at that opportunity. Because there you could only teach? Biblical studies. Jesus and yeah. the Bible. Yeah, in fact, this the, the Jesus book is really some of the lessons I taught to, to the inmates. Okay. Yeah. And, so and it had to be uh, Protestant enough. It, for all inmates, not just Mormon inmates, and that right. was that was fine with me. Yeah, and, and that uh, gave you a chance to what think more about this kind of stuff, more about the Mormon history. Well, it history did because my my and... file leader uh, sat down and I says, "Look, I've I've got some questions, and I I I would like to to go down to the jail and get away from the students. I was teaching my own kids, and uh, and see if we can work this out." I talked to many many professors. At BYU, and they all they saw, typically say things like, "Well, yeah, we got some problems in that area," but they didn't have very good answers. I didn't think. Yeah, and, isn't and that yet, interesting? Yeah, and the, and they still don't have very good answers. No. Um, so so that's kind of how that that. And it, isn't it interesting how you would take a set of facts and evaluate them one way, and someone else takes those mm -hmm. same facts. And and doesn't see it or, or something. I, I don't know. It's I've I've noticed that too with other people that I've dealt with. That it's uh, I I see these certain facts and I can't deny them. And they if you think about them as a combination, mm. they cause real problems. <laughs> it makes you struggle. Well, you know, I mean, my wife, my first wife was dying and died, and I put everything away for two or three years. Then I got back into it after about 94, 95, mm. and I talked to lots of people. I was really trying to find an orthodox answer to these questions. I really, I like really that comment that you made that I would like to get an orthodox answer. In other words, I want to get an answer that really holds yeah. up. But in 2001, the signature was pushing me, says we need to, we need to get this in, and I finally just one day says, I, I don't have orthodox answers to these questions. Here they sit, and there's no real doctrine. And you haven't had anybody come to you other than personal attacks, but really exp say that anything you've written here is is wrong. That's that's what Jeremy Reynolds did in his. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, in his if there's anything letter. in there, we'll change it. I, that's yeah. what I would tell my high counsel. But yeah. none of them had read the book anyway, so what difference does it make? <laughs> I like the comment you made, and I think Jeremy used it as well, is how can you repent of a truth, you know? Yeah, something that's probably true. <laughs> yeah, how can you repent? And so so the book comes out, and, and now you've retired by then, by 2002, right? Yes. You retired 2001. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had a couple of experiences, though, that I, I wanted to maybe share with the audience. At least one was a young lady that you had... Uh, it, and I hope you're okay with this. It's in your book um, about a young lady counseled a young woman who bitterly hated her father. Do you remember this? Yes. She came to train. Do you want to tell the story, or should I read it, or do you want to tell it? Um, Can you? Do you remember it? I mean, I mean, I know I'm putting you on the spot, and I apologize. Well, she just hated her father, and we sat there and talked for 45 and minutes. And transferred that to God too, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She transferred it to God. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't getting anywhere with her. And finally, I just says, could I give you a blessing? Yeah. And I put my hands on her head. And boy, this, there was a powerful uh, feeling there. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't say anything for two minutes. And it's just, it just like 
God was taking over. <laughs> and she was crying, and I was crying, and when it was over, I just says, do you still think God is like your father? And she says, no. And do you think Heavenly Father loves you? And she said, yes. Yes. Yeah. And what 45 minutes of counseling failed to do, this feeling and experience with her just completely changed her attitude. Wow. Well, I, I remember reading somewhere that you'd given over a thousand blessings. I guess they'd hear about your, your blessings and want one. I mean, that's a tough, tough thing. The inmate isn't? mentality is interesting. They, uh, it's just like, oh yeah, a blessing. I'll have a blessing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here comes the med guy. Yeah, meds, meds will cure. I, I don't care what kind of meds. Meds will help me. Oh. It's an interesting mentality. So someone gets one, one person gets a blessing, then they figure, well, you we just well get one, huh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I I was usually pretty uh, optimistic with them uh, as a spirit, unless it constrained. But uh, mm -hmm. it, it's probably the most effective part of my ministry in the jail. Was it? Yeah. It must have been rewarding, though, because some people do find Christ there and realize they've been forgiven of their sins. They really do. They just have so many... You know, if you and I have one or two fires to put out in our life, they've got five or six or seven yeah. that's been with them since they were teenagers. Probably. And they put two or three out, and they, they still, still got four got, more. Yeah. And so they they mean well, but they get out and free, and, and so many of them come back. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing about the saving grace that we uh, yeah. probably will talk about a little bit more. I, in fact, I heard that Son of Sam, they... Mm -hmm. Berkowitz or whatever his name is. He's mm. an associate pastor now in his prison cell, so you, you just never know. <laughs> well, I remember just being exhausted coming out of the jail one day. It's in the Incompar Incomparable Jesus. And I, I was just thoroughly exhausted. I list, you know, after 13 years, most people don't last that long as a counselor yeah. with inmates. They burn out. Yeah. And I was starting to burn out. No. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, I'd given blessings and I'd heard all these confessions. They used to call me the Bishop of Salt Lake City. <laughs> they knew me all. I had to go around and visit these people. And, and uh, anyway, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, anyway, uh, I remember coming out of the jail just totally exhausted. And uh, what did I ask? I Just under my breath, I, I just says, uh, I felt the spirit yeah. of renewal, and uh, I just says thanks God, and He says thanks for doing my work. Oh my goodness! Sentence right in my head. Yeah. Thanks for doing my work. That kept me going for another. Yeah, I'll yeah. bet. Yeah, it was. You know, after you've been there 13 years, all everybody's case just becomes one big case. Does it? <laughs> it all comes together. It runs. Can't remember. A lot of coming and going, I guess, in the jail. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the other th interesting things in this book, in page five, six or so, is uh, you tell a story, uh, and you've repeated it before, but if you'd share it real quickly here, uh, or not necessarily quickly, but just uh, about going, walking on a street and things getting darker and darker. Well, I think if you don't have a resolution to, you, you study it and you study it and it gets pretty tense in your life. I, I almost think if you don't resolve it, you could have mental health issues. Yeah. And I, I wondered, I thought, here I am teaching seminary, I'm teaching my own children and I'm having this incredible uh, crisis in my life. And so one night, I just, I, I had a dream, and I, I dreamed that I was uh, walking down a middle-class neighborhood sidewalk. Yeah. And it was interesting to me that the sidewalk was actually going downhill. Oh. <laughs> and when I turned the corner, it was total blackness. I mean, you couldn't, it's like Tim, Timpanogos Cave, yeah, you've been there, you and turn the, the light you out. can't see your hand, and it's right, yeah. it was that black. Wow. And I, I started, uh, I says, how do I find my way out of here? And I could, I could sense a light behind me. I turned around, and it was the Savior. And for about five to six to seven seconds, he, he, he just radiant. And he, he had his arms up like he wanted to embrace me. 
And he says, I am the way. Oh, my. And that, boy, then I woke up. And I went right to John fourteen six. I am the way. I am the way. I am the, the life. I am the truth. Yeah. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I thought, there's my answer. Don't worry about the rest of this. Joseph Smith doesn't really matter. Jesus is what Jesus matters. Jesus matters. Yeah. And I accepted that emotionally, but still not intellectually. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took a while. But that was my answer, and he was trying to put me at rest. Wow. That's a tremendous story. And, and then you follow that by showing how many times Jesus says, come to me, follow me, I am the way. I, Constantly. Just throughout the, the New Testament. And then I realized that we need to do more of talking about Jesus than we do in at least the LDS church, yeah. and even some Christian churches don't do it yeah. as often as they need to. He's a very jealous God. He, he says, uh, I'm the pay way. attention. Yeah. Well, it was I, interesting. I, I'm, I'm here a short time, and yeah. pay attention. Pay attention. Well, it was interesting for me, too, as I started. It took me only, only but about three or four years to really come to the groups with these or come to questions with the first vision, the Book of Abraham and the changes in the Book of Mormon. And yet I never did have that sense of Jesus at all. I thought I was OK with him. But I know now I wasn't, but I didn't realize that. And I, I credit really your book. I credit Sean McCraney and others that would say, mm -hmm. don't trust me. Trust the Bible, read the Bible, look at it, and turn to Christ. And so I have appreciated these books and, and the influence that you've had on, on me and I'm sure well, many I others. Found, I found Jesus Christ in the LDS Church, but I had to work at it on my own. It wasn't just, today we're going to talk about Jesus. It, yeah. This is not the way it works, as you know. I mean, yeah. Jesus just kind of falls through the cracks. They're very high on talking about organizational concerns and the beautif beautiful beautiful. Uh, the beautiful restoration story, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and Jesus just kind of, they sing about him in the sacrament prayers, yeah. and they close and in his the name, but, yeah. you know, they just don't do a, a lot on the curriculum. No, they, they really don't. And, uh, and I missed, I, I knew there was something wrong, but I did find Jesus. I found the importance of being born again and the emphasis, importance of saved by grace through faith, yeah. not of yourself, and so forth. Uh, do you feel like a, you're a new creature? That's yeah, a, I That's did. my best way of saying it. Uh, I don't know about the born... Especially when I was... Uh, well, Jesus, it's one of the few commandments he actually gives him. Yeah, you must be born again. John 3, 7, you must be born again. Yeah. He, didn't say, he didn't say it's optional. Yeah. And when I was doing reading or writing this book, I wrote it... Uh, the, the Insider's View came out in uh, 2002. Two. This was 05. 2005. Yeah. And I just felt a real special uh, uh, attachment with Jesus when I re researched I'll that bet. book. It was a very special time in my life. Yeah. And you'd seen him work probably throughout your life and certainly in different ways. And we're going to cover those probably in our next session, a few more of those tender moments that you've had with him. But certainly seeing his influence at, probably in the jail was... was uh, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, yeah. it's tremendous. And I found out something about my employer, Jesus. Yeah, what was that? If those inmates will budge that much <laughs> in their attitudes, he, jumps. he will be there. <laughs> and boy, I start That's thinking, amazing. you know, I'm, I'm kind of used to reading the newspapers and give them what they've got coming, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I found out that that's not how he works at all. Yeah. Well, and not about religion, is it? I mean, it's just not about no. the institution and so on. Um, a lot of them just feel driven to Christ. Yeah. They don't have anything else. The family's gone. Their hopes and dreams are kind of gone or shattered. They're driven to Christ. Uh, just maybe back up just a little bit. Back in, your, your first wife passed away in 1992. Was she aware of, you'd been married in the temple, of course, and all that. Was she aware of some of the concerns you were having and why you went to the Oh, she read the manuscript. County? Did she? I says, well, what do you think? She says, I think it's probably true. <laughs> she did? Yeah. Well, that gives you some hope. That, that was comforting. <laughs> <laughs> I also told my her mother, my mother-in-law, that yeah. I says, things are... 
you no. know, things are not what they say. Not what we've been taught. Yeah. And uh, she says, "Well, go slow." Yeah. <laughs> was she but willing she, to listen? She, she's not a. Well, no, I wasn't that far along at that point. To, yeah. You hadn't yeah. really come to those conclusions yourself. No. What was the moment that you finally? Do you remember a, a moment when you said, "For me, it was the the day that Carla said, okay, I've got to know what you've what what's going on.'" And then it was the first time I'd ever verbalized what I'd been thinking for two or three, four years. And that's important to be able to, some people can't verbalize finally it. Finally verbalize. And that's, I think, my moment of, of okay, I'm, I'm acknowledging out loud that I don't think Joseph Smith was what I thought he was. And then I didn't even know about polygamy and masonry and so many other things. I just knew about these three or four things that I'd been. Did you have a moment like that? It doesn't jump out of me, but when, when Signature Book says we need the conclusion. That may have been. And I thought, okay, I've got to face I've it. I've either got I to don't, I decide don't. one way or the other. All <laughs> four of the foundational visions of the church have the same problem. They escalate. They get more miraculous. They more get impressive. Impressive, yeah. more unique, more physical. And, and I thought, it's not just one of them. Not just the first vision. Not just the angel gold plate. Not just the priesthood. Not just the eight witnesses. All four of them do that. Everything. And I had to say, I don't have an orthodox answer for this. In fact, it doesn't look very good at all. And then the first half of the insider's view is on the Book of Mormon, yeah. various things. And, uh, I mean, it just looked to me like uh, this is not an ancient book at all. Had you read B.H. Roberts by then? Oh, yeah. yes, yes. That was a book that influenced me a lot, too. Here was also a church historian. Oh, yeah. And uh, 70 who was saying, you know what, I don't think the Book of Mormon is what we think it is, and if we don't tell our youth about it, we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> people don't, young people today probably never even heard of B.H. Robert, but I'm telling you, B.H. Robert was the greatest defender this church ever had. He stuck with it. He was the greatest. He's honest. He, he's he? the greatest defender. He, he was the spokesman for the for the Mormon people in so many ways. He was, he was honest. Yeah. And uh, I still revere the man. I, yeah. I have high respect well, for I, him. I appreciate his honesty in trying to tell the brethren what really was going on. Yeah, with I fell the on deaf ears. Well, guess what? We're done with our second visit. Oh. Can you believe that? So we'll wow. catch this one more time and uh, cover some more material with Grant Palmer. I appreciate so much your sharing your story. And as I say, following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ, Hope you'll open your eyes and learn a little bit. See ya.